And a great good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. This is Carol. I'm really excited to be opening our first keynote for Aussie Live 2014. Yay! Woohoo! We want to say thank you to our sponsors and supporters, first of all. But we do want to say a big good morning, good evening to Steve, who is our keynote today. Give us a wave, Steve. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we're, of course, using Blackboard Collaborate. And this has all come about because of our team at Australia E-Series. And we have a sponsor in the CBER Academy. And we are partnering with the Learning Revolution Project. And that is the subject of Steve's presentation this morning. And of course, Shambles and I are supporting it on the sidelines. So thanks to all of our sponsors. We want to know where everyone's from. So we have a, a really tricky little map for you today. Uh, so I think we need to give you whiteboard permission. Yeah, thank you. Just, and if you pick up one of those little smiley faces, thank you, Steve. Pick up one of those little uh, circles and put it on the map and we'll see where you are. I'm just going to put myself over here. And we can see your light shining right across the globe. Oh, we've got a big smiley face happening over there in, must be India. Not sure of my geographics. <laughs> and this map is really cool because it shows all the different time zones that we're covering today. Clever. Well, thank Very you for clever. adding your circle. <laughs> um, which one's you, Steve? Where are you? North Carolina. Move yours. North Carolina, yay. <laughs> okay, and we've got lots down there in Australia. It's getting a bit crowded, but it's really, really fun to see where everyone is coming in from today. And I'm really happy to see you all. So I'm going to move the slide forward now. Had time to do that. Yes, Indian, it must be quite late for you guys. Today, our keynote is Steve Hargaden. And I'm so, so pleased to introduce my friend Steve to give us our keynote this morning. And he's going to be taking us through the whole history of the learning revolution, not the history of the world, I hope. <laughs> uh, so um, when I first met Steve oh, some years ago, you know, I was really in awe of all of the wonderful conferences that he was doing. And it struck a chord with me. And it wasn't until early last year when Steve came out and visited me here and did a whole conference from the cottage on my property where we started thinking about having Aussie Live. And here it is, the beginning of the whole thing. And to kick us off with it, we've got not only Steve Hargaden and the team are here with me. <laughs> so welcome, Steve. Let's give a round of applause in our usual way. Thank you so much. So fun to be here. And I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Carol. This is really fun. It is kind of the dream fulfilled of having an event where those of you in the Australia, New Zealand, South Pacific area don't have to be up in the middle of the night to participate in an event. And um, you know, we'd like to do the same thing for Africa. We think it would be fun to do to do that, and and maybe if we can figure this out and do it well, we'll we'll get there. Uh, special thanks to the team uh, who who have organized this. Um, this has just been a terrific effort, and I have really not played much of a role in the organization, but I'm going to give some special thanks to Amy Brinkley, who's working with me here in North Carolina, and who really shouldered kind of the normal tasks I would do. And so thanks to Amy for some great work. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the learning revolution, and I'm going to apologize right off the bat because uh, there is going to be a US-centric perspective to the first five or six minutes of this that, that I don't know to what degree they're going to translate to those of you in Australia and New Zealand, but I believe that they are somewhat universal. But you'll have to forgive me for this. I'm doing it for a purpose, and the purpose is to describe why I think this is such an important moment in time. Um, the, the 
question that keeps hovering for me is the difference between what we say we're doing in education and what we are doing. Uh, is that cognitive dissonance? Is it willful blindness or is it intentional manipulation? And I want to take us through uh, a little short history here to, it's a short and biased history, to get us to the place where I want to talk about why social networking and uh, in particular our, what I hope is our learning revolution project are really so important right now. So I want to make a connection between three periods of time. The first is the uh, 1890s to the early 1900s then the 1960s, and then the 2000s. And please, in the chat there, like Sebastian is doing, I would really like to hear your response as to how you feel this translates to where you are in the world. Okay, so in the 1890s, as I understand it, the ability to produce uh, magazines became significantly cheaper. Right? So the, the mass publication of what then became national magazines produced a an outburst of um, content uh, produced at cheaper costs and distributed more broadly. And it led to uh, a lot of journalist material, journalistic reporting on the, the problems that were occurring in the newly industrializing factory conditions. So you get a novel like The Jungle. And that uh, kind of journalism becomes um, is called by Teddy Roosevelt is muckraking. And it becomes a pejorative, although I don't think it started as a negative term, but it becomes a pejorative. And there's an interesting response to this. Right? So you have an increase in democratic voice. And the response is actually what we now call propaganda. That's, as part of the progressive era, there was a shift in belief about how a democracy would work. And you have the use by this man on the left, Edward Bernays, of propaganda as part of a overt and articulated strategy for reshaping governance. So you have uh, Woodrow Wilson and Walter Lippmann and Edward Bernays here talking about um, instead of uh, this concept of sort of a mass democracy, the idea of a smaller elite group who then kind of manage uh, the masses through the propaganda. And we see propaganda as a very negative term again right now, but at the time it was just considered a way of organizing and, um, and persuading others. So Edward Bernays was the double nephew of Sigmund Freud, both his mom and his dad, through both his mom and his dad. And it's really intriguing to learn about him because uh, he was responsible, this picture on the left is the Easter Day Parade from 1929 in New York. And he was responsible for, he worked for um, a tobacco company. He was responsible for this campaign where women uh, came out of the parade as though it was spontaneous, holding up cigarettes and claiming that they were tortures of freedom. And it was a campaign to get women smoking. And it was the start, or it was one of the starts, of this sort of broad way of looking at how you got people to do things, right? And so you used uh, feelings and emotions and symbols to mobilize. And uh, both Adolf Hitler and uh, Goebbels uh, were well familiar with Bernie's work, and, uh, and Hitler in his Mein Kampf references it in two or three places, this idea of using propaganda to um, to manage the masses. So this is a really interesting thing because I think we've absorbed this. And, uh, you know, you know it's, this is an abbreviated history, but this is from the Rockefeller General Education Board, the first mission statement. And at the time in the early 1900s, there was an enormous amount of money through foundations that was being used to sort of create what is our current U.S. public school system. And in the idea here, I won't read this quote in full, but the idea here was that uh, in this new system, uh, we're, we're not going to turn everybody into authors, educators, and poets. We're not going to have everybody sort of have their, magnify their individual talents. But we are going to um, 
um, mold people into sort of compliant, capable workers who will follow others. We already have an ample supply of the creatives. We just need people who will tend to follow. And that becomes uh, sort of this interesting subtext to what we do in public education because we talk about education as being liberating and freeing, but, but for the most part, it's about, you know, for 90% of the students, uh, it's about learning to comply and conform. And so again, it's this question of is this cognitive dissonance, is it willful blindness, or is it actual manipulation? I, at the time, I don't think it was seen as manipulation. I think it was an overt uh, belief in how you would, uh, the, this new progressive idea about how a democracy was run. So that's era number one, right, which is this sort of uh, emerging democratic movement uh, that um, the response is to say we need to have an elite group who rule. We have too much democracy, and so then we need a larger group of people who will follow. So the next time that this occurs, sort of based on technology, the first was the printing technology and the magazines, is the um, uh, television. And I, and I skipped a slide here, but you know uh, this sort of plays the, the the propaganda and Edward Bernays plays right into Skinner and the teaching machine. And, and the question I'm asking is. Is the teaching machine a machine that teaches, or is it teaching machines, right? And this idea of uh, are humans machines that you can just kind of get to do certain things, and how do you influence them? And um, you know, so so Skinner's teaching machine very much envisioned that the person is a machine as well for it to work. Okay, so then the next era was the 1960s. So you have the advent of televisions with mass television and broadcast. And you have, uh, you know, at least in the United States, you have the question of the Vietnam War. And the kind of abbreviated end result of that is you get sort of two responses. One, the political response, which is the Trilateral Commission's crisis of democracy. Again, we have too much democracy and we need to reduce democracy. And then on the educational front, you have a nation at risk. And so you have this sort of um, uh, increased sense of responsibility of the education system to to answer to to um, to be more proactive in producing the kind of people who will follow. So um, now we have the 2000s, right? And you have the internet. So you have the you have the mass production of magazines and print. Then you have the television, and now you have the internet and the web. And the educational response uh, certainly has been. Uh, no child left behind. Right? I mean, that is one way of looking. This is one way of looking at the history, and I'm not going to even begin to open the conversation of what the, the government response is. But I think we have this tension, right, where we talk about education as being something that liberates and produces independent thinking, and yet the bulk of what happens in education is um, almost the opposite. And so, at this moment in time now with the internet. This just incredible historic deinstitutionalization, where where power is shifting from institutions, right? So you have this moment where um, institutions can no longer control the story because the internet allows for all of this conversation to take place. So in politics and in journalism and in business and in learning, we have this shift in power away from the institutions into the individual. And I think uh, even I look. Really predicted this. And, uh, this is a fascinating book because he talks about learning webs. And how language is just so incredible. I get this idea that we could reach out and create these webs of learning with other like-minded people. And you know, this. So, so here we are at this incredible moment. This moment of uh, shifting uh, uh, who who tells the story and how the story gets told, and shifting how we think about these uh, institutions in our lives. And certainly, we're doing that about learning right now. Okay, so that brings me to this moment of, of a moral imperative, right? And um, I wonder if I have the slide here. Let me check and see. Um, I'm, I'm going to go forward and come right back. Here's the danger. The danger is that we become so occupied with detailed tasks in this sort of production machine concept of who we are and how we exist in the world. And, and then being so occupied, we miss the bigger picture, right? So that, that if we're working in a company and we're doing our job and our little piece of the puzzle, it's really hard to then look at the whole company and say, should I even be working at this company, right? 
the, the danger of that sort of factory machine model is that it's very hard for us to look at the bigger picture because we're so sort of in, in appropriately engrossed in the immediate tasks. And, and, and that's what I've, I didn't coin this phrase, but I really love it, right? It's called being in the thick of thin things. So we're constantly sort of in the thick of thin things, things that are expected of us, things that we have to do. So the question is, is there a moral imperative? And education has a moral imperative. Right? I mean, I think most people who are in education are in education because they, at some core level, believe that this was really, really important. And I'm here to do something important. And nobody says I'm going to go into education so that some significant percentage of the students who leave the school that I'm at are going to feel incapable and, and not confident of their abilities, and they're not actually going to be able to be uh, able to, to work on their own because they feel like they're failures. I don't think I don't think that's intentional, right? So again, this question of uh, cognitive dissonance or willful blindness or uh, manipulation, right? So for me, it's this moral imperative that this is my own statement, right? Education not as social control, but as helping to build individual knowledge and self-direction and the abilities to navigate, participate, and create in this world, right? So we have this new world in which institutions are no longer the, the keepers of the soul narratives. You have journalism with incredible sort of proliferation of alternative viewpoints. You have uh, the long tail and the opportunities to work in different fields. You have a political discourse now, which is much more sophisticated than it's ever been in my own life, because the narrative isn't owned by one group. And it means this is a very different, difficult world. And morally, how can we feel comfortable sending a student out into life without the skills to be able to navigate and manage and, and participate in this world? So <laughs> I think education and bureaucracy got this memo. Well, this is the difficulty, right? I mean, this is the difficulty of all of us being sort of down in the trenches. And it's, um, we're all working hard and we're all doing these things. And it's really hard to sort of look up and say, okay, this particular assembly line that I'm on, or this particular job that I'm doing, how does that actually relate to the larger, bigger picture? And, is it, and, and, and we're sort of taught that's not our responsibility, but our responsibility is to do our job well. And so we don't often look at the larger picture. In fact, a lot of us go into jobs and work that's very similar to the lives of students where we don't have voice and we can't say something that's different than what our company says because we're, we're paid to be loyal to that idea. And so it puts us in a place where, well, for many of us, it is cognitive dissonance, right, or it becomes willful blindness. I promise this is going to be short. I'm going to move on. This isn't, you know, this is just sort of a prelude to my, and by asking some questions here. Okay, so I want to talk about the learning revolution according to me. Not because I'm anything special, but because I've seen a particular slice of this pie that relates to this question of how we we reestablish a dialogue about education. And my slice of the pie has been from running these communities, these learning communities for educators. All right, so I started with Classroom 2.0. Um, it actually started with a project called School 2.0, which didn't succeed, and it turned in, you know, the idea turned to Classroom 2.0, which did then have some legs and move forward. Then you can see an early iteration of the Classroom 2.0, web, excuse me, website, and you can see a little bit of the newer modeling. And, and both of these are really about conversation, right? So there's this moment at which these places, these social networking places, allowed for conversations to take place. And interestingly, when, when we started Classroom 2.0, it wasn't evident that that was going to be the case, right? I mean, we, we, there was blogging, there was some conversation, but the initial debate was, does social networking even have a place in education? And so I'm sort of here looking at the little piece of the pie where I had these social networks and I started these events. And from my standpoint, it was really obvious that bringing people together, that this was like the hallway at a conference rather than the formal session. It was where the real kind of engagement was taking place. And this was with educators talking to each other. So we had this sort of initial debate about was there even a place for social networking? And for me, it was, it was obvious. But I think that it showed that there was this battle between rote learning and constructed learning. Right? There was this sort of the separation of the, the formal session at a conference and the hallway conversations. 
a difference between the classroom setting and the playground or the, uh, you know, heaven forbid, the computer lab down the street or the shop class, right? That there, there were these two conceptions of education. And what social networking, I think, showed us, and it, and it kind of surprised us, was that there was this social aspect of learning that we were ignoring or that we weren't thinking about as much. And somehow, arguably because it fit the interests of, the, of, of those institutions that depended on our following, it had been downplayed. And, and that would be kind of a power issue, right? So the people who were in charge were succeeding in society and you know, are not really interested in having people sort of rise up and question and do different things. So I think one really interesting lesson that just came right out of social networking and watching educators use social networking to talk to each other was the reminder of social learning. Okay, and another lesson was that those of us who participated in this, and that picture to the right is one I use all the time because it's a representation of how I felt. When I started blogging and podcasting and doing the things that I was doing, uh, it, it kind of exploded my brain this ability to be a part of the conversation, to talk to us. It's hard to even remember how significant a shift that was, but it was a really dramatic shift for me. And I think it was for a lot of people, and I think a lot of us who have been through this process feel like we've gone through a form of a cognitive revolution, and it's driving our desire to help students experience the same thing, that, that it kind of opened us up to this possibility of being creative. Now, there are always people I knew who did this, right, people who were on the school yearbook or worked in the school newspaper or, you know, you know found something they loved and, and went and did it in college, but I wasn't that guy. I was the follower. And so for me to participate, you know, in my late 30s, early 40s, and have my brain kind of explode was a really significant thing. And it, for me, it was a, a huge part of the lesson, the learning revolution, was that we adults were going through the same experience in this. With the social networking, we were having the hallway conversations instead of just being seated and listening to somebody else. We were participating in the blogging and the other stuff, and that brought us into engaged conversations, and we felt alive and a part of this. And we said, okay, we need to bring this to students. This is really important. Okay. So finally, I think the, the, the other piece that I got to see by virtue of where I was was that the actual organizing of the social spaces holds significant lessons for the organizing of social learning spaces. And uh, this is um, Caroline McGuire's, not Caroline McGuire, um, <laughs> I'll tell you in a second. But, uh, there's a book coming out, um, and it is, uh, and I'm, I've got a chapter in the book, and I'm just drawing a total blank, so I'm going to apologize, but it's, someone will put it in the chat. Anyway, this really lovely lady is pulling this book together. And anyway, so, the, my chapter is on the lessons that I think we've learned about learning from social networking. And I want to talk about that today. So I set the stage, I think, by talking a little bit about kind of this concept of where we are historically, how technologies sort of open certain doors, and how it's not necessarily guaranteed that those doors are going to stay open or there isn't going to be pushback. So I think it's really important to identify what we think the lessons are and to say, these are important, and let's let's make sure we focus on these, and let's kind of look up from our thin things, the things that we're working on that we have to be working on, and look at the bigger picture. And and so my goal here is to actually give. There's a whole series of these. There's not going to be time to go through them all, but I want to go through some of them and and give you a chance to also contribute in the chat and to talk about the things that you feel that we've learned about learning from these social spaces. And, and maybe what I'm doing is kind of priming the pump. Okay, so um, and so these are things that these are lessons I feel like I learned about how you would run a social community that were unique to the nature of these online social communities, and then that seem to me to be very parallel to lessons about learning and and building learning communities. So the first thing for me is that it's all about the user or the learner. As, a, as the creator of a social network, what you discover pretty quickly is it's really not about you, right? It's, a, it's an opportunity to create a space, and sometimes you create it and people don't come, and you have to be comfortable with that. 
So it's all about the users wanting to be there. And you can't mandate it. You're not telling them what to do. You're just inviting. And if it makes a difference and it's valuable to the user, then the user comes and uses it. And you've done something valuable for them. And I think that's a really interesting shift from how we previously built structures and, and how we build social spaces. And I think it mirrors this sense that, of how we actually think about learning and we think about students being involved in learning. So I love that we learn from the interplay between us. Okay, the next one for me was that the early adopters in these social networks were actually more important than me as the creator in terms of their influence on the direction of the network. And this is an interesting one to kind of try to make a parallel to education with. But the what I noticed was that I could set the stage for the network and for people to be involved. But it was the people who came in and actually really started using it and connecting with others and influencing others who made the network what it was. And so if, if we think about that, it's sort of this idea that, okay, um, you know, my father just passed away and he was dean of admissions at Stanford at Princeton, and he often talked about sort of building a class of students who would learn from each other, right? And so this this idea that you can kind of create the environment, and then you're 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 recognizing that the really significant influences are often going to come from the peers or the informal mentors rather than the formal, right? So if I think back on my own life, I think about moments when I you know, things that are really significant to me. It's, Things that were said to me or things that happened that really turned my life in a direction, they were not often, or they often were not the planned thing, but they were some interaction I had with someone else. So it's interesting to kind of shift your thinking about creating the perfect content to creating the space in which people will interact in ways that, that provides the most likelihood for those kinds of mentored or relationship situations. Peggy says, she would argue the early adopters are the creators. And I think there's so much truth to that, right? There's, it's kind of humbling to think that you create the space and you're so smart and you've thought of Classroom 2.0. And the fact is, it really wasn't me, but it was the people who came in that were the creators. OK, next for me would be the importance of supporting, recognizing, and rewarding individuality. So. Um, and this probably goes along with the last point, right? But the, the idea here is that people come into a network like this. And the thing that Ning did that was so brilliant as a social networking space was that it, if everybody who commented, their picture was up. I don't know. I know that doesn't seem like much now. But at the time, there was such a difference from the blogging environment where you could, there was a blogger who was getting a lot of traffic and you could make a comment in there you know, a post a comment to a blog post that they had made. But if you didn't put it in all caps, it was probably going to get missed by others. And so it often led to sort of competitive, uh, critical conversation rather than collaborative, rewarding conversation. And one of the things that's very evident in a network is you have to reward the individuals who are there and help them gain benefit from being there so that when they make contributions, when they say something valuable, that they get some benefit and credit in an opportunity because of that. And so that's often kind of the opposite of how we treat a lot of uh, the way we think about learning, right? I mean, we're, we're thinking about conformity. We're thinking about specific things, not individual contributions. And I struggle with this a little because we have this language of collaboration. And I understand the importance of it. But I'm, I, I think sometimes the the a desire for teaching collaborative skills misses a part of the, the valuing and the promoting of individual passion and creation. And that we're not intended only to be collaborators, that the value of our being collaborators with it comes from our ability to, to, to feel like we're contributing uniquely because of who we are. And so uh, I, I, maybe that, I, I think there's a tie there, and, and you can let me know. Okay, next up, that the real energy comes from volunteers and peers who want to be there and want to help. And, and that's probably been stated in what we've talked about right here but so far. But that the, the buzz, the energy, the sense of wanting to be there, the sense of wanting to be in the hallway, to be in the bloggers cafe, right? The bloggers cafe could be in any place in a conference or at ISTE 
you know, on the floor somewhere, and it's not the, you know, the, the where the organizers said the fun has to happen. It's where the energy comes from, the people who actually want to be there. And I think there's a huge lesson there about learning, that creating an environment where learners want to be there and are learning is contagious. Okay, next. Encouraging instead of mandating. Right, so uh, again, maybe these are self-evident, but there's certainly lessons that I really had to learn personally uh, in order to build the social projects that I worked on. And um, the mandating just didn't work, that it was really inviting and encouraging. And then encouragement it just holds so much more power than anything else. Uh, you probably notice Peggy George is kind of the pinnacle of this characteristic. Uh, if you watch Peggy in sessions, She's always saying something positive and supportive, and I think it comes from her heritage and legacy as a as an educator, and uh, it's something I really appreciate about Peggy. Um, and I'm not going to have a chance to read all those comments, but I'll pause in a second here. Build for independence. So uh, again, when you're building a social networking platform, a social site, if there's a connection here between building social learning sites. This idea that you're building for someone to become independent, to be a creator. And so, like in Classroom 2.0, you're trying to give them every opportunity to start the process of creation and to get feedback and uh, to, to actually do that as an independent activity. And I think that's a really good model for thinking about learning. That, again, there's the same set of lesson from the social spaces to the social learning spaces, but the ultimate goal is a sense of competence and confidence in participating. You know, we hear this thing about failure a lot, and this will come up later, and I'll just skip it. But I realized the other day, it's not failure that I value so much, it's risk. So we talk about creating space, spaces for failure. Uh, I understand the meaning there, but for me, it turns out that it's actually risk that I care about, which is a willingness to say, I can try something. And it may not work, or it may work, but it's really important to take the risk and to feel comfortable taking the risk. And so building, you're building a space in which people will take risks, will try things. Um, and if you build that, then the space is vibrant. If you don't, they won't. So not only am I building through Classroom 2.0 and these other communities, but I would consider the, uh, like the All Day Unconference before ISTE, a form of the same kind of community building. And so if you don't create a place for people to do things independently and to take risks, then they're not really going to be excited about being there. Okay, next lesson. Build parks, not cafeterias. And I've talked about this before, and, and so I don't feel like I need to drill down too hard on this. But parks get built typically in stages where they kind of watch what people do, and you provide opportunities for people to do things, but you don't mandate down to the to the hour and minute what people are going to do in a park. You create the potential and the capacity for activity rather than mandating the activities. Whereas cafeterias are sort of certain foods at a certain time, you know, a park often, they'll put the paths where they notice people have actually been walking on the grass. And they'll build the tennis courts or the basketball courts, and then knowing that people will use them and figure out ways to use them in healthy ways. Engagement trumps content. This one's really important for me. It's this idea that until you feel like you've gotten engaged and really can contribute and can learn and have some sense of your capacity, um, learning the content doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, I'm, always, I'm sort of intrigued by this, the way that we sequentially teach things that we didn't learn sequentially, right? That, that people who become really good at something then use a method of organizing that information that allows them to retain it and have access to it based on sort of the, the ultimate conclusions that come to about that material. But the idea that we would then sort of push that to somebody in that sequential fashion rather than in the discovery fashion, it to me is fascinating because it really doesn't make sense. That's not how most of us have gotten excited about something and have learned it deeply. So something we have to figure out is how, you know, how do we allow for the randomness and the serendipity that take place in social networks when we're thinking about social learning. Okay, and then inclusion and support from competition and criticism. And, you know, there's just so much here. Um, Campings Drive, uh, Douglas McGregor, um, Edwards Deming. There's, we know so much from the business world about what actually uh, creates an environment for um, 
good, authentic, valuable contribution. And it certainly is not a competition and criticism. And um, intriguingly, why do we do this? Again, it's part of this cognitive dissonance or willful blindness. Why do we subject so many of our students to feeling badly about themselves, believing that they will somehow uh, feel confident leaving? Okay, so let's take a break, a pause here. I'm going to try and do some of the things in the chat. If anybody has something you'd really love to say, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, this, this, that's the first half of my set of lessons that I think that, I, that I've learned from building social community to thinking about social learning, and I'm interested in the responses. If you want to raise your hand, there's a hand icon in the participant box. It's the third icon over, and feel free to raise your hand. Carol, you don't need my permission. You can go ahead. Uh, so there's been a, a very large conversation happening in the text chat around all of the lessons that you've shared with us today. And uh, obviously, um, someone has picked up on that point you made about, well, perhaps we don't need to build more cafeterias. We need to build more parks. So Diane is asking for some more specifics on that if you want to answer her. Sure. And I don't know that I have a whole lot more to say about that, except that you know parks are built around the capacity for activity whereas a cafeteria is typically a set menu delivered at a certain time. And so if we think about building spaces for learning, that's a lot different than building curriculum. And, and I mean, I know that's a stretch, right? It's a stretch from how we do things and how we think. But I, but I also think that uh, there is something really significant about, about building the capacity. I think maker spaces are all about that. And I think that's part of why they're attractive to us, because maker spaces are like a park. You have a variety of machines. It's like shop class 2.0. You have all these machines that can do all these cool things, and the kids can figure out what they want to do, and they can move forward on something independent. That that's you know that's having created the capacity or the um, the opportunity rather than the the se sequential curriculum. Okay, so I'm going to move on quickly. Please keep chatting, and we don't have to go through all these. In fact, I'm not going to do a whole lot more, but socializing and fun are critical. Uh, what we know about play, what we know about being outdoors, what we know about connecting with each other. Uh, there's a reason people go to conferences <laughs> and sometimes don't go to sessions or hang out in the evenings and spend time together because that's we're human beings and we connect with each other and our learning and our satisfaction with ourselves and our contributions are wrapped into the social and, and we can't push that away. And it's I think it's uh, arguably criminal that we believe it's okay to medicate a huge percentage of our students in order for them to feel more comfortable being in circumstances which don't allow kind of the freedom of movement or the, the higher social social needs that all of us have. And, and that's probably opening a can of worms, but, uh, and, and my guess is that many of you would agree with me, but I think it's, uh, we, we've learned that socializing is in, or we relearned, we've been reminded that it's important. Focus is critical. So what I've learned about social networks uh, in their creation is that they can't be everything to all people. And so there's an importance in having a network be focused. Classroom 2.0 is, we know it's too big, right? It's not, it's not the sort of small focus it was when it had a 500 or 1,000 people. And, and we're built in some way to respond to smaller numbers and to focus, focused conversations and ideas. So we need to allow for that. And, and we need, I mean, sort of mass standardization, I think, goes against everything that we know about how we operate as people. Um, and, and to the degree that we need to be focused locally or in small groups on building things together rather than having them sent to us from top down. Again, continuing lessons. Don't let the institutional tail wag the dog. One of the biggest mistakes I discovered in building social networks for educators was that when an organization would come to me and ask for advice, they typically uh, were driven by the institutional requirements to show certain levels of engagement and other things that were actually not the critical factors. And uh, most, if not all, of those networks didn't succeed 
didn't produce engagement because an institutional tail was trying to drive the drive the dog. And, and again, in, a, in an era of deinstitutionalization, it's hard for institutions to realize that they don't actually that some of the things that, that were made them so valuable previously are not the things that are valuable now. Uh, promoting risk, we've talked about practicing benign neglect. Okay, this one is really important to me. Um, uh, my dad, whom, whom I just mentioned, uh, didn't do well in high school, uh, worked, then went into the Army, and then came back as a younger adult you know, in his early 20s, went through college in three years, found out what he was really interested in, and became quite successful. If my dad had been measured uh, based on his freshman through senior years in high school, and if that traveled with him everywhere, he would not have had the opportunities that he had. It's not fair for us to so strictly categorize and track people. We have to practice some benign neglect. We have to allow people freedom. We have to allow them to make mistakes and to recover. And we have to be willing to sort of look the other way and say, we give second chances. That's what we do. That's what life is about. And so maybe benign neglect isn't the best way to describe that. But for me, it's a really important concept. Uh, I'm really worried that if we track students in such a way that no matter where they go or what they do, somebody has evaluated them and that becomes our only or first impression of them, that we've missed something really critical about being human and the opportunity to start over. And so we have to sort of proactively determine that there is value in, in this. And Yang Zhao talks about this uh, quite uh, eloquently about the, sort of the second chances of cultures. Go give, get. This is also really important, right? So what I learned in social networking was that you start, you find a way to authentically provide something of value, and then you look for the opportunities that come back from that. This is about the opposite of sort of the culture that we've, that a lot of us have grown up in, in terms of how we contribute to society and our expectations for, for the contract we have with others in terms of receiving things in return. People talk about the end up being a gift culture. Uh, there's something really important here about being able to try things, figure out what people really need and how you can help them, and then looking for opportunities to turn it into a living, which is very different than calculating the living and not thinking about the, the, the going and the giving. So uh, that's a subject for another day, but um, it was definitely something I learned in, in building social networks. Trusting others. Uh, the, the willingness to allow others to take the lead, to do things differently than, than I would do them, these were very critical to my own growth in uh, creating spaces where people felt comfortable um, learning together. Push responsibility downward. Uh, if, you've, if you've been to one of these conferences before, you know that uh, we provide pretty much everybody who wants to the chance to present. We push the responsibility down to the presenters to learn the, the program. We ask them to schedule themselves in. Uh, as much as possible, this pushing responsibility down which shifts the balance of power away from the institution to the individual in really positive and productive ways. And it's much more natural. And, uh, and again, uh, institutions will protect their role. Uh, Ivan Elch talks a lot about this and, and sort of the ways in which institutions perpetuate. Uh, in a deinstitutionalized society, uh, we're trying to help people learn to take responsibility individually. And that was a significant part of um, lessons from social networking. Democratizing learning spaces, that's probably pretty self-evident. And promoting self-construction of learning spaces. So this was a huge lesson for me. Right, so I started Classroom 2.0, and I really agonized about the fact that I didn't want anybody going anywhere else. I had created Classroom 2.0. They should all come to me, and everything should happen in Classroom 2.0. And it was a fluke of, um, of the moment that I uh, ended up taking a job uh, with Ning to help promote uh, Ning as an educational platform that required that I give up the reins of trying to have everybody come into Classroom 2.0 and encourage people to start other Ning networks. I don't know that I would have gotten there on my own, but wow, did that turn out to be a really significant lesson in terms of building uh, a social space, which was the more that you helped people build their own, the more that your 
ability to help others and your credibility grew and the opportunity to serve others was magnified. And so this is something that we that we hesitate to do in many ways, but maybe the lesson is that we need to be helping people to build their own learning spaces and, and not always be in control. And ultimately our goal is, you know, that we would have students who would find communities of practice around authentic things where they were actually working with people who are doing real world things and participating with them. And that means kind of letting go and letting them construct their own learning space, one that we don't necessarily control, and that they that we're teaching them the skills of how to build that learning space rather than building it for them. Okay, and then finally, some of you have seen this before for me, but it's the you first idea, right? You know, the, the whole airplane, our airplane piece, right, which is this idea that uh, the masks come down in an emergency. We all know the language here. In, in, you know, in the case of a loss of cabin pressure, and mask will descend. Please place it on yourself first and on the child. We think most often that that's because if we're not alive, we can't help the child. But it's really because the children are reluctant to put the mask on if they don't see an adult put it on first. And this is so critical, right? We can't ask students to do what we're not doing. If, we've gone, if we go through the cognitive revolution, if we figure out how to contribute, if we figure out how to be um, uh, doing things that we care about and have, having confidence in our ability to research and to synthesize and to, and to do things of significance, that's the biggest lesson, right? Uh, and I've, you know, I've talked about the fact that you know, I am a reader because I saw people who read and that I saw that that meant something to them. And so the biggest thing that we can do is, is to live these principles and live in such a way as to exemplify the value. And I can't lead a social platform if I'm not living the value of that platform. It's so transparent. It's so open. Every time the web is so, so valuable, we, you know, sort of awkwardly become exposed. And so I, uh, I can't just be the guy who organizes something. I, I, I have to be living that learning myself. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know if that made any sense. I'm hoping it did. I'm hoping that, you know, maybe it sparked some thinking about the ways in which uh, the, the web and social networking are reminding us of important uh, truths about learning and that they help us to think about this historical period of time in which we are again at a place of the technology creating democratizing influence. And in these last two periods that I've identified, the early 1900s and 1960s, there was, there was a pushback against that and there was a move to conformity again. And, and I think we have to make a choice and we have to create a moral imperative to say, this is really critical. It's really important that we rethink learning, that we go through a learning revolution and we remind ourselves that it's not just in school buildings that learning takes place. It's not just in schools, but it's in museums and libraries and online and at home that learning can take place in all of these areas and in the institutionalized world that we are now the ones who will redefine and reshape what learning is and that it's really important to, to be on that task. So that brings me to the learning revolution. And the learning revolution is at learningrevolution.com. And it is an attempt to aggregate the projects that I've worked on and that many others have worked on into a single space. So there's a, um, uh, a calendar of all of the events that there's a shared community calendar in which anyone who's not commercial or nonprofit who's providing events or activities for educators can list their events. And that we bring together the school, library, museum, work, adult ed, university, homeschool, all of the places where people are thinking about learning into uh, uh, an area for conversation. And again, if I've learned my lessons well, it's just one of the areas. And it's an attempt to, to build something that, if it's authentic, has an opportunity to make a difference. Um, and, and hopefully we're doing that, which is providing a space for this kind of conversation to take place and for people to connect with each other. And so uh, this week we're announcing two really fun events. 
Uh, on April 24th, we're going to hold the Learning Revolution Conference online, bringing together all of the um, the the organizations, the, the groups that I've just talked about. So from my library conference, from my museum world friends, to bring people together to talk about learning and uh, to talk about what we've learned about learning and what people are learning about learning. And <coughs> excuse me. And then in early May, we're going to hold a three-day deep dive at Black Mountain in North Carolina, where we'll actually, those who would like to can get together physically and have longer conversations about the learning revolution together. Um, there will be some formal aspects to it, but it's going to be more of an unconferency event, an activity, and where it's very inexpensive to, to stay in this beautiful facility run by the YMCA. So we're also going to open it up for three days beforehand for anybody who wants to come and hike and play and do some other things uh, that are completely unstructured. But uh, look, for, it's the 9th through the 14th, uh, and we'll be announcing this week at learningrevolution.com. If you're an organization that's holding events online or in person, you can email Amy. Go to the learningrevolution.com site, and there's, you'll see links to emailing Amy to get your events to show up in the calendar. We are sending out a weekly a uh, newsletter to about 120,000 that describes the events coming up that week. Uh, and part of what we're trying to do is to make it really visible for uh, anybody who wants to, to know what, what they can do online or in person, mostly online, uh, in that upcoming week, most of which is free, to expand their own connections and communities in their learning. And as part of that, we're resurrecting a program that I ran for uh, Illuminate which is now Blackboard Collaborate, called the Host Your Webinar Program. And so there's a way to schedule a webinar in there. Uh, again, we're pushing responsibility downward. You put it in the schedule, and you learn to use the program. But we'll put it in the calendar and in the newsletter. And if you want to host a webinar on a topic related to learning, it's non-commercial. We would love to support you. So, and finally, I now have a place to put all the education quotes that I've collected that I care so much about. So if you go to learningrevolution.com, go into the More tab, and you'll see a link to all of these great quotations. Um, as well, we're highlighting videos from different conferences, and we're letting you submit quotes. And, and really, we hope that you will tell us how we can build a space that really helps the learning community uh, grow and take advantage of this moment in time. So I'm going to stop there. I know I've probably gone further than we really wanted to, given the time. But if there are questions, I'm glad to take them. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll give our usual applause for you there. Uh, you just use the hand clapping there. And we have, yeah, a couple of people. Um, just clapping there for you. Thank you for taking us on that journey. That was awesome. Uh, it really got us thinking off on the right foot straight away today, and I think that that really is a great start to our conference. Um, we might have a question or two, and probably the best way, folks, is if you do have a question, just raise your hand and I'll give you the mic. And I just wanted to... Um, as you're thinking about your questions, I'm just going to move to the last slide so that you know that you can uh, get some badges for your participation and you might want to do that later on. And when we exit from the room today, just to put that in before I forget, that there is a little survey for you to fill in. So if you could take a couple of minutes to do that before you move on to the next session. So uh, my advice would be make sure you're part of the learning revolution. And I, I think because you're here today, you already are. And if you would also like to join the Ning site for the learning revolution, please go to uh, that link that Peggy put in or Anne. And if you put it in again for them, that would be great. So I, I want to say a big out. shout out to you. Oh, you're nice. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I need to give a shout out to Heidi Hayes Jacobs, who's the editor of this book series. <laughs> I just space. My apologies. But anyway, and, and to all of you for organizing this event. I'm so excited for you. I can't wait to hear how it goes. The first year of what I hope will be many 
uh, really fun to see you taking the ball and running with it. And, and let's help others to do the same. Thank you so much, Steve. And oh, we're India. Really yes, glad let's you do it in us India. Today. It's lovely to see and hear you. <laughs> yeah, looks like you've got a convert already. All right. Now, Anne's put up a link to Julie Lindsay's session, which is starting in a couple of minutes. And uh, we would love you to go to uh, Julie's session or to Tara's session. If you've got a link for that too, Anne, that would be great. So without further ado, a big round of applause for Steve, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody. I will now close the recording unless there's a final question. Looks like we're all good, Steve. Thank you so much, and I'll close the recording.